right welcome joe hello how are you i'm good thank you Sylv. under the circumstances yes 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 tell me about it um anyway it's let's try to forget it for a moment or two and it's uh, lovely to have you here thank you so much for agreeing to do this um Joe, you and I are our colleagues. We're both based at uh, the Tavistock. We have obviously slightly different roles, but I thought it would be really, really good to speak with you here on Social Workers Matter because you've got a very long career and I think you've got some important stuff to say about our profession. Um, and as I always start with, with my guests, I, I, I like to, for them to share something of their careers in social work. Um, so let's start with, with where it all started for you, Joe. Share with us how you okay. be involved in this thing. Gosh, I mean, this is, yeah, when you say long career, Sylvia, it suddenly reminds me of my age and... Uh, <laughs> You know, I'm one of those people now that say, sort of talk about the last 30 years, which is uh, interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, I always like to, to start with this, to say that when I left school, I trained to be a chef. Oh, OK. I think it sets a little bit of a context about me and my background, really. And I, um, well, I love cooking and I love food and the whole kind of thing that that means within families and connecting to other people. So it's a big part of my life now still. Um, was it ever going to be something I did for a living? I, I'm not, I don't think it, I was really destined for that. And after a few years of, um, of doing that, I, I felt that I wanted to do something more meaningful, really. And I saw a job advertised in residential care setting for people with learning, learning and physical disabilities who were um, coming out of long stay Victorian hospitals oh, yeah. in, the, in the early 90s. Uh, and into the community and they needed somebody to help to <clears throat> them to learn independence and to cook right and I didn't know that there was such a thing as social work or residential social work in the world at that point I, I was 21 mm -hmm. um I had had very little experience of social care I didn't know it was a thing other than things I saw on Children in Need, really. And I remember watching Children in Need and thinking, oh, I'd like to do a job like that, but I don't know how you would do it, how, where you'd find a job. Because mm -hmm. um, my world was sort of smaller, I suppose. And so this was like a door, really, into that world. And I felt like the job was mine when I saw it advertised. I just thought, this is the thing I was kind of hoping for. Mm. So I started working in residential care at, in that role and within six months became a full time part a sort of member of the care team, really. And uh, they then got somebody else in to do the cooking. <laughs> and the rest is history, really. So you went there as, as the cook? I went there as a cook, yeah, a cook, but uh, with a particular role of sort yeah, of being yeah. involved in their care and support. Right. Um, which I loved. I mean, it was such a privilege. And I learned so much from all of those people about, um, about people, really, mm -hmm. and about what people need and how different they are and how people communicate non-verbally, because many of them didn't use language to communicate. Um, so it was such a learning curve for me as a human, really. Yeah. Um, and so I worked in residential settings then for sort of quite a few years until and I became a manager in those settings and a registered manager um, and eventually had the opportunity to do my social work qualification, uh, which was supported by the local authority at the time. And I was very fortunate um, and went to university, which was I was the first person in my family to go to university that wasn't in my frame of reference to do that. Yep. Um, loved it. Uh, we had one placement in those days. It was an 80-day wow. placement, and I was really lucky to, to do it in an adoption team, which, and at that point, I thought I would never become passionate about anything other than disability. Uh, and suddenly, this whole other world opened up uh, in relation to adoption and working with adopted people or people affected by adoption from sort of birth right through to, uh, you know, working with older people who wanted to find out more about their roots. And it, it was fascinating. 
Uh, and I was fortunate enough to get a job as a social worker in that team when I qualified, okay. um, which as you will know about children's social work, that's kind of like slightly the wrong way round. Usually people sort of start at the front door and they, yeah. they might sort of uh, progress to working with children in care and adoption sort of towards the end of their career. So yeah. I, the yeah. story at the time was, oh, well, people go to the adoption team to retire. And I thought, well, not me. Uh, yeah. But of course, I was surrounded by some amazing people, mostly women who have been in social work for sort of 40 years or so. And they were an inspiration to me as a sort of newly qualified social worker in my early 30s at that point. Right. Um, yeah, so I, and I, I suppose my specialism then in social work was uh, adoption and permanence and working with children in care. But also because of my management experience at the time, I, I mean, I'd worked, I'd managed residential services for probably 10 years by then. Right. Um, I became a manager quite quickly and I had all throughout this was complete, had a fascination with supervision, mm -hmm. social work. Um, and I guess that's all that sort of formed a real interest for me alongside the sort of statutory social work role with children and families. Um, and it took me to a point of, I guess, in 2015, I had the opportunity, I was doing my master's and uh, one of my academic tutors um, said to me that there were some jobs uh, coming up at the university and I should consider applying. And again, I would never have considered that that was within my realm to be an academic. Mm -hmm. I, I thought that was something other people did, really. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And so... You know, that just makes me reflect at this point, Silv, about some of the key significant people in my journey, really, through my career that have kind of sort of encouraged me into a different role or, hmm. you know, given me the confidence to do that. And, and so I worked uh, for the University of Bedfordshire initially, it was my first sort of academic role, as a, straight in as a senior lecturer, which was quite something really at the time. Um, but, I've, you know, again, it's been it was such a good decision for me to do that. And I, I think it's um, been an absolute privilege working alongside people learning to do social work, but also sort of post qualifying as well. OK, um, let's just pause a second there, because I'm just thinking um, from what you're saying so far, it, it doesn't seem as though you had a very you didn't have a clear, distinct plan uh, in terms of your career trajectory um but i mean would you say that the decisions you've made have felt right uh what because sometimes i think for many of us who who sometimes struggle with with making decisions mm. and, and how we make decisions in terms of our careers what would you what would you say informed your decisions and the direction mm. you took that's I, that's a that's a great question. I mean, I've, I've, I've had this philosophy, I suppose, for quite a lot of my adult life that all decisions are right at the time. Of course. You know, I think that you, you know, particularly when you're talking about personal decisions that you make, whether that's about your personal life or professional life, most of us uh, sort of do some level of thinking it through. Um, and I think, it, you yeah. know, I don't have many regrets in life, actually. Um, I think for me, though, some of those decisions have been contingent on other people's encouragement of yeah. me um, and kind of like letting me know that or people that I've really respected that will kind of let me know that they think I can do it as I've needed that. I, it's not always been something that I could just draw. I'm, I'm not always sort of driven by thinking that I might be good enough to do that. But yeah. as I've grown up and as I've matured and developed my confidence and sort of sort of know my worth really I think a few years ago I I always have a mantra every year Sylv as a person so I don't do new year's resolutions but I have like this is my mantra for the year yeah. and my mantra a few years ago was to be 10% braver oh cool and it led to me actually um, applying for my role as the practice supervisor de um, development program delivery lead mm -hmm. um and working at the Tavistock. And um, it was a part-time job at the time and I'd always work full-time because I'm the only breadwinner, I sort of need to. Yeah. Um, I sort of took a leap of faith really. And I 
handed in my notice from my previous job, applied for a job that was part time, knowing I would need to do other independent work and not knowing what that might be, yeah, really. Yes, yeah, yeah. so I remember um, our discussions. <laughs> but something in me, it, it, by being 10% braver, enabled me to just sort of take that leap of faith. And I think for me, it was quite scary, but it's really done a lot for my confidence. And it's sort of something that I might share with. Um, with others that mm -hmm. might come into sessions with me through the PSDP about being braver. Cause I think some of it is about really, yeah, my own self beliefs really. So I, I think I have, I'm a little bit better at reaching a bit higher mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. you know, ste stepping into something really different that, and taking a risk. Yeah, that's a useful nugget. Definitely, definitely. Mm -hmm. So um, you, you, find yourself now in education um well i say now you've been involved in education for some time um what, what are your sort of thoughts about the whole education space and where we're at in terms of uh, social work education i know that you're you're sort of passionate about the the cpd um piece but do you have a sort of an overview of, of, of social work education uh, at, at this point in time? Hmm. Um, I mean, I guess, gosh, there's several ways I could respond to that, Sylv. You know what, I mean, I'm, I think... I'm, I'm asking the question because sometimes um, we, I don't know, we're so, we're, we're part of it, but we can be critical about the direction it's taken and, um possibly even critical about what's going on now but i mean that that's sort of thinking i'm having really and that's that's behind the question i mean there's i think there's lots of uh oh, there's there's a lot of controversy in terms of social work education in this country at the moment and i guess uh you know i could go down the road of answering that on a political level um I think when I, we think about politically, we think about some of the sort of structural discourses in this country, mm -hmm. I think social work education's clearly been affected by that. Yeah. And sometimes I think, so, well, and clearly social work has as well. Mm -hmm. And I think in lots of ways, we've become quite a marginalised profession that's been reduced yeah. to something that isn't really what um, is at the heart of... Um, the concept of social work and I think you know there's been moments in my career right from being a social work student right through to sort of being a um, a practice educator or in my position now or working with yeah. social workers that are in the system in a post-qualifying um, capacity um, yeah, well, I think we're sort of swimming against the tide in terms of some of that structural inequality and being a marginalised profession and mm -hmm. being very focused on performance and uh, managerialism. And um, so I think for me, for me, social work edu education uh, as an individual, I think it is an opportunity for us to, on the ground, on a micro level, to bring the heart back into practice, really. Okay. And so I think that's how I've always seen it. I, you know, I think I, I respect the structures and boundaries that are there that might need to be challenged or pushed. Mm -hmm. um, but equally, I think it is about getting alongside people at whatever point in their career and being able to uh, bring the feeling back into the work mm -hmm. um, and, and address the, uh, for me, the emotional and uh, relational psychosocial landscape of the work is yeah. what makes it successful. Um, so it's bringing that much more into people's consciousness. Mm. Um, mm. And I, mean, I think that the best way we can do that as educators is to model that. Right, right. I mean, this is so important for, I mean, obviously I'm a bit biased. I'm thinking of, of my current social work students and, um, you know, what, what I'm trying to convey in the work that I do. Mm. I guess equally in terms of mainstream social work, um those what you've just expressed there is so important for, for people to hear mm. um, because i recall vividly um you know as, as a practitioner as a manager that i i bought into the entire uh outcomes 
argument uh, <laughs> and outcomes activities because it's very difficult i think not to um, yeah. so you know what what do you think are the sort of pressures that you know those of us who are trying to reclaim social work are facing um in terms of those who are working within the the systems how are we ever going to actually how, how do you think we we can kind of bring the whole piece closer together i don't know if i'm making sense but um i'm thinking that you know on the one hand you've got us banging on about uh, the need for sort of bringing the feeling back into the work that we're doing on the other hand we were constantly being challenged by those who are out in the field saying well you know it's difficult we don't have the time it's you know the demands are too are too much um on us at, at, at present how do you think we can kind of travel that very rocky road um, and bring those two ends closer together I think I mean that's such a big question isn't it and when when I listen to you sort of talking I mean I guess in in asking that question you're summarizing the the sort of binary problem that that is there that sort of it's almost a split isn't it between what we're being asked to do and what's actually happening uh, it is there's, there's such a big gap and yeah do, is it about bridging a gap or is it about sort of changing things um I, I, yeah, it's such a big question, Sylv. And I think, I think social workers, and I mean, I, I work with managers a lot now, are facing so many challenges in trying to um, be everything to everyone. Mm. And so, how do you manage? Um, how do you manage those kind of discourses of um, managerialism? Um, and performance alongside um, good sort of support to practitioners that enables them to be resilient, feel contained. I mean, I, I've always had this theory that if you get the emotional um, aspect of it right and people feel emotionally held and supported, then the performance and the improvement and the um, standards kind of do get met. But I, I think you, you know, it's. Um, that's so vague to just say that, but I know certainly, yeah, we, the, it's, it's interesting on the practice supervisor development program that the participants' confidence in being more emotionally available and intelligent has gone up and yeah. we've measured that, but so also is their ability to manage performance and improvement. So that does tell me there is a link there between those things. Yeah. And I think it is possible to do both. Um, it is, it's not about, it's not about finding time for reflection and um, curiosity as an, an add-on. It, it's got to be mm. within the same sort of waters, really. Mm. I mean, it, I mean that then brings me to to let's have a discussion about what what lie beneath the work that you have pioneered with the, the PSDP. But um, as you were speaking, one of the other things I was thinking is that you know if we can improve people's ability to have difficult conversations which is you know it's central to a lot of what we do in social work surely that must have um, repercussions on on practice as well because um even when you're thinking about things like performance those are difficult conversations to have with people um difficult to identify uh, in, a, in a very clear way difficult to discuss um, in supervision without all kinds of other problems arising. Um, so just from an emotionally resilient um, perspective, if we can build um, build that up in, in, in our people, that will no doubt have, have, have loads of benefits, I'm sure. But what, what, was the, what, what was the whole notion around the P, and please tell us what the acronym means, PSP. <laughs> Well, uh, practice supervisor development program yeah so what was the what was the thinking about that why why was that necessary why was that developed um i think it's well probably several reasons but the main one that i would be aware of is that the uh, dfe uh, recognized um 
within the sort of um, the Department of Education. The Department of Education. Sorry, self. Yeah, so the Department of Education, I think, recognise, um, and this is sort of well rooted in the literature, that people um, that are new to becoming practice supervisors, or indeed many of us that have been managers and leaders in social work, haven't really had um, many sort of learning and development opportunities in order to um, tell us how to do that. Yeah. We kind of mainly learn from our own experiences of supervision. Yeah. So it's an acknowledgement of that. And it's, I, I guess, partly in support of um, the knowledge and skills statements um, about practice supervisors for children and families and what they should be able to know and do. Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess it's in support of skilling up the workforce. So that's, that was the that was the motivator. And, and um, what, what attracted you to, to the programme? Me, I mean, I I have for a long time been really passionate about social work supervision and good social work supervision, and so to be part of a national program that's going to um, hopefully strengthen the workforce in terms of supervision, and it's so pivotal to good practice supervision. Um, I, I think you know so much rests on it. Yes. I think to be part of a program that's going to uh, hopefully influence that um, across the whole country, yeah. um, why wouldn't I want to be involved in sure. it? You know, I think it's a, yeah, so it's a great opportunity. And I think for me in my own, um, my own career, my own interests, my, my PhD studies are looking at supervision. Sure. Uh, it sort of aligned everything together for me, but I, I, you know, I guess I felt I had, a lot to contribute but also a lot to learn as well and it's uh, I certainly have learned a lot um so tell from us the people that I'm working with okay yeah absolutely um mm. so tell us a bit more about the program itself because in a way um it's it's definitely a, a space in which you're making a sort of mega contribution um and it may also encapsulate some of your vision uh, for the future in terms of social work practice and uh, particularly supervisory practice. So tell us a bit more about the programme and, and what's been going on. Okay, well, um, I mean, the programme the program has been running for three years now. I mean, we're delivering it virtually this year because of the pandemic. That's not the uh, way but it what, Sorry, Syl? That's not the way it started. No, it started as a residential programme. Um, and it's a sort of six month program. So the so participants that come on the program are, are sort of involved in it for about six months. Um, and there's various components to it, which include sort of face to face um, taught sessions. So um, it was five days. It's now six. Um, some small group development opportunities where they can experience um, exploring a dilemma using um, various different models for group conversations, uh, reflective conversations, and also some one-to-one -one individual development um, sessions. But the programme itself is sort of centred around some really core principles about relationship-based practice, leadership, um, draws on sort of psychoanalytical, psychodynamic and systemic ideas, yeah. uh, as well as, um, you know, ideas around restorative practice. So, but I mean, I would say the notion of relationship um, and the sort of concept uh, that we might understand as parallel process is sort of really like a central thread. And when I say parallel process, it's sort of recognising that, you know, what goes on in people's lounges, you know, when a social worker visits a child and their family, what goes on there can get played out in supervision. Um, yeah. And what goes on in supervision can get played out with the family um, as, a, as a small example. Yeah. And so there's something there about sort of a golden thread, really, that runs through the work. Um, so on the people that come on the program as practice supervisors, we're encouraging them to think about how they work with social workers in supervision, really model something about good social work practice with children and families. Um, and it's interesting that people come on the programme and that's a big light bulb moment for them. Mm -hmm. They've become a manager. 
they're a new supervisor or they might be a really experienced supervisor and they suddenly sort of see the link between being a good supervisor and being a good social worker. Um, and I think, and, th and then we sort of start from there really. Yeah, that's good because I mean, I think um, for many of us who, who may have sort of done that journey, um, you are a bit of a loss as to, you know, what, what that whole transition is about from social practitioner to manager and um, I, I recall vividly in my own case mm. um, there was a lot of um, a lot of emphasis on resource management mm. um, and in terms of how I supported social workers um, it was very much hit and miss mm. there's lots of lot and I mean you know it was a sign of the times um, lots of emphasis on, on managing resources, budgets, um, which is part of the job, but not the only part of the job. So, um, but what, what I'm also noticing in, in a lot of um, local authorities now, uh, they seem to be adopting this sort of system of practice supervisors who may not necessarily have that heavy resource management piece but there definitely is an emphasis on, on these folk supervising and, and supporting frontline workers with practice issues. Mm. So, yeah, I, I don't know if, if that's your perception of, of what's going on at, at the moment. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I do get, I think I've, I've been in a privileged position, I guess, the last three years to get to spend time with people from all 152 local authorities in the country or different regions so but there are definitely themes that come through about yeah people sort of grappling with whether they sort of separate off conversations do, do they sort of have practice hubs that just look at practice or do they try and create reflective spaces do they separate personal supervision from case supervision you know, I, think I can see the profession is grappling with, do we need to separate those components out? Can somebody sort of holistically hold all of those functions of um, supporting the workforce in, in one conversation? Um, so I, I guess for me, I mean, I think all of those things are probably all very rich and helpful, um, but I do think it is there's something about the way that managers or supervisors or leaders sort of carry themselves and their role um, in, in everything they do. Um, mm -hmm. and, and what's amazing is, you, you know, I think people think that it needs to be some huge thing that they do. But, you know, some people will come back to us after um, being on a couple of days on the programme, or certainly I do some of the one-to-one -one sessions, where they'll say, I've started supervision by, or when I see people, I'm asking them how they are or how they're feeling. Yeah. And just asking about that, completely changes the conversation or they might use um, different tools in supervision to express how they feel about working with a family and what's what's going on and and they've learned that just by asking a question in a slightly different way really elicits a different way of the social worker talking about the family that's maybe less procedural and um, more sort of addressing and what's going on underneath the surface and so it is sort of nuanced things that people learn that and I think it is all those small things that will contribute to making positive changes in the um in the social work profession yeah yeah it's you know you're reminding me of um a comment that Marion Bauer makes in her um I'm remembering it because I'm reading it at the moment um what's it called thinking under fire where she says quite often it's you don't really have to do much fancy stuff um, to make significant differences so um, yeah I certainly resonate with that but okay Joe. so I mean you've given us um, quite a bit of an education in terms of, of that particular program but I guess one of the things I'm curious about is what, what have been the sort of some of the challenges that um, you have faced because you know we're in well, we've always been in a turbulent environment, but um, it wouldn't be balanced if we, we don't also think about some of the challenges mm -hmm. um, that, that confronts us in, in trying to do this work. Mm -hmm. What have you observed? Um, 
I mean, I think, I, I guess the obvious one would be... If you want, is if you want we, to say. <laughs> so, sorry, Self. So if you want to say. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I think I can, I can honestly say, and, you know, it's not going to be a secret to anyone, um, that, you know, there are times in working in the social work profession that we all face the spotlight. We all face possible blame. Um, you know, we all slightly worry about whether we might make a decision that renders like the whole organisation in disrepute. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's quite heavy. I think it's always there that. So that is a really sort of weighty backdrop, I think, in social work practice. And I remember as a manager, particularly around the times um, of the death of baby Peter Connolly, I think, you know, that did remind us all, actually, that you know, our own sort of personal space could be really disrupted by, you know, practice um, decisions yeah. and the context we're in. And of course, you, you know, at the time, I, I only knew what I knew. And I just thought, gosh, you know, this isn't a million miles away from my front door, actually. And so, yeah, that's a real challenge, isn't it? And we, I think people are all, are all navigating that all of the time. Uh, that And that sort of, I think there's, there's often, um, and I, I feel it even from my position in the, in the, on the PSDP, sometimes I might ask myself, you know, what is it the profession or the Department for Education are, are hoping from us that, that we're going to solve in a way? Mm -hmm. Uh, it can become quite linear and I think it, it's you know there's it's um we can get sucked into that blame culture quite easily so I, th I think for me that is a very sort of real uh challenge that, that all social workers live with uh, mm. whether they are social workers that are Ofsted inspectors or whether they're social workers that are directors of children's services or academics or whether they're social work students, you know, on some level, we, we all feel that in the water, really. Um, and it affects everything we do. Absolutely. And I think that that can only really ever be counteracted by relationship and finding our kind of way of way through that, through sort of, you know, not, not forgetting that. I think learning about systemic ways of seeing the world has really helped me to navigate those challenges as well. Um, that sounds quite a sort of macro way of answering that question, Sylph, but I think that that's where that takes my thinking, yeah, that's, is sort that's, of, yeah, that's, you know, that structural challenge. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. Um, and I think um, it's useful because at the end of the day, you know, there are two levels operating and um, sometimes one has to step outside to, to sort of see the bigger picture. Um, Least of all. But, you know, on the ground, you know, the challenges are working with some families where you just get really stuck and you can't find a way forward mm -hmm. or um, a relationship with a colleague that's troubling you and affecting your working life. Or if you're managing somebody who's not doing what they need to be doing and there's a big spotlight on them and you're trying to kind of help them through that. And you can really get sucked into that sort of very... Uh, sort of linear or quite binary way of seeing those things and I think the real challenge there is to be able to step back and you know really do see it from that structural level and think well what is needed what does this person need from me to help us kind of move in a different way yeah um, yeah I think um to sort of sort of finish off that bit about that program um I mean I've become involved in it now uh, and, and certainly, in, and I'm still very much in the early stages, but I'm getting a real sense that, that the people who are on the course or on the program are really valuing the space, the, you know, to think about their own development, to think about their work. Um, they're valuing somebody encouraging them to take the space to think mm -hmm. about their, 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 their work and their development. Um, and it just reminds me so much that that not enough of this goes on, I think, in terms of our own uh, our own professional um, arena um, because of the demands that, that are placed up, upon us in terms of the field. So I'm really getting a sense that, you know, at this early stage, um, 
I suppose my concern is sustainability and how do we keep the momentum going, which is, which is a, a big challenge, I think, um, because it's, it's, it's so easy to, you know, as we know, it's so easy to sort of get sucked back into ways of doing things, particularly the way organizations function uh, and the pressures that are, put, are brought to bear on them. And I don't know if you've had any thoughts about that particular issue yourself. Um, Which particular issues that so? Oh God. Uh, how... I mean, I've got a response to your. I, All right. I... Well, 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 hold on a second. Let me get my thought out, and then you can give me everything you have. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, people valuing the the opportunity, um, sustainability, and momentum. You know, because we're opening up something that that we can't possibly. Um, carry in into the longer term we're 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 doing stuff that we're hoping others will embrace and carry forward so i'm just wondering if you have any thoughts or any responses really in terms of that sure yeah i do i mean the thing that really strikes me or where where it takes my thinking is mm -hmm. i guess back to i've written a few blogs for psdp and what my first one i I, th I guess because I travelled around and I've met a lot of people on the programme. Mm -hmm. Not that I should have needed reminding about this, but it reminded me what fantastic people we have in the profession, mm -hmm. whatever context they're in. So some people are in outstanding authorities, some are in ones that are really struggling uh, and that might have been deemed as inadequate or requiring improvement and having a long history of that. But no matter which organisation they were from, mm -hmm there is some fantastic, really impressive people doing the work. Yeah. And, you know, another thing, and it, it sort of made me fall back in love with the profession all over again. I just thought, you know what, there's some blooming great people in our profession. Yeah. And they're coming to this course, they're giving up their sort of day, they've probably got a hundred things going on in the background, but they're focusing on being here and being really present. And they're coming back and they... They're wanting to go away and try different things. They're all ambitious and they come back and they share what they've tried. And I just, it's so humbling. It really has been. And, and again, this year with our virtual delivery, you, as you will imagine, we've been grappling with poor internet connections and people getting kicked out of Microsoft Teams and Zoom, left, right and centre. Yes. And I spent a whole day uh, delivering the programme where some poor people have been bounced in and out of, of their connection all day, but their tenacity mm -hmm. to come back into the room and carry on. I just think if that's our profession and the people that are managers in our profession, then, you know, despite all of the challenges, there's something incredibly resilient about um, our workforce. Now, whether that's enough and whether that's OK, I don't think we should ever be complacent about that. But actually, there's something that drives people to come into social work and stick at it. Um, yeah. that, that I think we we just need to think: what is it that keeps sustaining people to do that? Yeah. And and what I know what sustains me is being able to spend time with people where I can kind of be myself and reflect and have nourishing conversations. And if we can bring that into the workplace as much as possible, whether that's with our peers or with our managers and with children and families, of course, then, um, you know, that's the direction we need to keep going in, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Lovely, thank you, that's, that's wonderful. Um, okay, so let's park that to one side for a moment and, and bring our attention to the Tavistock. Um, you know, we both work in that environment um, and I know that you have some ambitions around um, what you'd like to see or what you'd like to contribute to to that whole space um, what, what are your thoughts about about what not what we should be doing but what we can be doing in terms of a, a social work discipline <clears throat> in terms of education of, of um, those within the discipline what do you think needs to be going on could be going on i know that um you're thinking about some sort of developmental work um that can be shared within the discipline 
Um, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, a that's challenging, good. that is quite a challenging question for me to answer, Silv, at this point in time. But I'm really, uh, it's a great opportunity to go there. Um, I mean, the Tavistock is a beacon organisation globally mm-hmm. uh, in this country. It's um, got a rich history and, and some amazing people working there. And I feel very young in terms of that, uh, my experiences of the Tavistock. And my role as, uh, so other than my PSDP role, I, I have a, another role in the Tavistock, which is a, a de- sort of more developmental role in the uh, social care leadership and management portfolio. And I only started it in April, which is, and it's been a really unusual time to start that role during a pandemic. So it's been very remote. Um, and so quite unexpectedly for all of us, we've been thrown into this situation where managing sort of a digital and virtual ways of working has kind of sharpened up. And it's not what I came into, you know, same as, you, same as most of us. So there's been something, I guess that has created opportunities though, because I, I suppose sort of joining a big organisation with such a rich history and and strong story as a Tavistock you do wonder you know what's my place in this organization and how do I navigate that and certainly how do you navigate that remotely when you're new so for me I just think and I suppose it's um, a stance I've always taken when I start a new role is what can I offer not what can I not do yeah Um, but what is it that I might be able to bring that's uh, that's helpful to people whether that is uh, what I've learned about um, virtual learning spaces and how we can, at the moment, use a platform such as Zoom to have reflective conversations, which go against a lot of the Tavistock traditions, perhaps. But what can we do? Um, and how can I think what is what has enabled me to do is to sort of think about my creative side. And um, I, I'm, I like to consider that I'm an artist as well as a a social worker mm-hmm. so yeah what can we do how can we use the limitations of what we've got to try to try and bring some of those sort of important Tavistock traditions into the virtual space uh, within the limitations of of course my experience of that and how can I work alongside other um, really sort of experienced um, and esteemed colleagues to, to help them to think about that you know can can I offer that I guess the other sort of very important thing for me as well, still, that's really close to my heart, uh, personally and professionally, is that of um, everything that has kind of been brought to our attention through the Black Lives Matter movement erupting, I guess, Mm -hmm. this year. Mm -hmm. And thinking about how we can all be much better and more curious in thinking about racism. in, uh, in particular in every strand of the work we do um, as educators but also as social workers how can we kind of create spaces to help people think about that in a in a safe way that enables sort of challenge and curiosity and so for me I think you know that is a focus for me this year I know it's a focus for a lot of people but it's sort of thinking what do I need to learn and you know who who can I join on that journey really um, as well as, I guess, all the all the other things I'd want to do to sort of uh, develop our offer to the social work profession, which is happening alongside those yes, things. Yes, and, and they will dovetail, no doubt, which, uh, mm. which, you know, like you, I'm always looking for opportunities for dovetailing and what can be transferred and, and you know, what can be shared. So, yeah, I totally agree with that. Mm. Righty ho. So um, I was going to ask you a question about uh, vision, but you've kind of answered it in a sort of a way. Um, mm-hmm. But I don't know if, if, if you have any other visionary um, kind of insights or comments that you'd like to make um, as we as we come to a close. Well, my vision for well relating to, I guess, um, your role um within the Tavistock your role on on PDSP your your thoughts about social work generally um I mean I know it's 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 a bit difficult to to think in very positive terms at the moment but it might not be so I don't know what 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 are your 
It's, it's interesting because somebody, I can't remember who it was, but somebody I was talking to recently described living in the extended presence at the moment. Because okay. I think it's quite difficult to think too far ahead because of the uncertainty we're all in. But there's something about you can't just be in the present moment either. But I like the idea of the extended presence. Mm. And so within the extended presence, we just need to do everything that we can to keep moving towards um, keeping relationship alive in social work in every way that we do it. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not saying that, so, and I think that that, all, that needs to change and move with the times, including wherever the pandemic might lead us tomorrow or next week, or, you know, hopefully in five years time, we'll be in a very different place. But I think it's sort of focusing on um, keeping um, that curiosity around relationships and, and how we keep connected while we're apart. So it's that kind of, you know, I think that thing for me at the moment is how we navigate and how we help everyone navigate being together apart. Wow. Well, on that note, Joe Williams, that was beautiful. Thank you. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure. I really like talking with you, Sylv. It's, uh, yeah, it's given yeah. me a lot to think about. Oh, um, and me too. And, and we have the benefit of this recording so we can actually go back and... And, and, and reflect and look and, and think and you know continue to draw the nuggets. So thank you so much for spending some time with me this morning. It's lovely. And um, yeah, no doubt we'll speak again. Yeah, thanks for inviting me, Sylv. You're welcome, my dear. <laughs>